It had been a long time since Olivine had seen the rippled light of the sun, and she missed it. This far down, the sun was barely even a murky circle, let alone the celestial blaze of glory the human books described it as. Barely worth looking up for. Rays did reach down here, but they were too faint for her tastes. That was easy enough to fix, with a little time and care. Olivine had no chores to do today, so on this morning, she made the choice to spend her day near the surface, drifting where she could bask in the warm waters of the shallows. She would make sure that she wasn't seen. Humans rarely went anywhere near her favourite basking spot anyway. She left her cave, emerging into the open blue with the graceful swish of her tail. Her spines brushed against the rock and allowed Olivine to sense how far away from each wall she was without her having to look. One more beat of her tail and she was free. The depths huge and expansive below her, an undulating turquoise murk above. Her current neighbours were out in the open waters close by, courting. Salt, the big male, emphasised his movements as he swam, a gesture of strength to any smaller males who might be watching. He had two consorts, his type always did, and they courted right back, both flirtatious and happy to be near him. Or rather, both acted the parts expertly. Olivine politely took only a little notice of his partners, it was considered rude to look too closely, and distracted herself from her own gossipy desire to know which one was which by signing to the group, Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning, the consort signed back, although they too were clearly only being polite and returned their focus to their tryst right away. Salt didn't even notice Olivine. Olivine didn't mind, though, and propelled herself up through the salt water. They seemed happy. The big male, the female, and the small male in disguise. That was the way of things with cuttlefish merfolk. She lost track of herself as she ascended, which was always a sign of a good day off. When she found herself close enough to the surface to come back to the presence, she felt surprised. And warm. Olivine had forgotten how soothing warm water could be. She stretched out her arms and tail, glorying in the sensation before twisting around to expose her chest to the sun, spines dragging in the plankton-rich water. The surface itself was several arms lengths above her. This was near enough. It always gave her chills being this close, but that was okay. All part of the charm of the shallows. She flipped over again and swam closer to the rocks, slow and leisurely. Ah, <sighs> this was the perfect... Something tugged at her hair so she instinctively reached back to ruffle her braids to free whatever had got stuck back there. No sooner had she taken her hand away when it tucked again, harder this time. She hadn't felt anything, but there was definitely something in her hair. Irritably, she felt more thoroughly for whatever it was. A stray piece of plastic or wood, maybe, or... An overcurious fish? Something sharp pricked her finger. Then it pulled again, this time in earnest. She was in danger. Olivine turned and dove down into the depths in a panicked effort to get back to where she was safe. It was all well and good floating near the surface and feeling all edgy about it, but there was real danger up there. Not that the deep couldn't be dangerous too, but at least the dangers down there were natural. There was definitely something behind her, something heavy that she could feel she was dragging with her. It thrashed. 
And then she realised that it was a living thing. A scared living thing. So she turned to take a look. A human. He, Olivine was quite sure it was a he, thrashed around, trailing silver bubbles and trying to jerk in such a way as to swim upwards. But he couldn't. And it began to dawn on Olivine why. He was the one tugging on her hair by some invisible means. She reached for her braids again and felt the sharp metal. It was attached to some kind of fine string. She felt it with her fingers and brought it in front of her eyes. It was almost invisible, but it was strong. She flicked her fins and drew close to him. His forearms were bound together by the string. He saw her and gaped in shock, his eyes trailing from her mess of loose, braided and dreadlocked hair, down her kelp shift, down to the orange and ivory stripes of her tail, her long spines and flowing fins. Then he remembered the desperate situation he was in and started thrashing again. Air exploded between them and Olivine saw the problem. He could not release himself from the invisible string. He was drowning. She reached for his forearms, and such was his fear and desperation, he offered them to her despite his shocked look from a moment ago. A quick check confirmed her fear. She couldn't break him free in time. The mermaid looked up. They were a long way from the surface. The human was squirming, his eyes squinting in extreme discomfort. Olivine reached a decision. She pulled the bracelet off her wrist and wrapped it around his fingers. The enchanted stones of her bracelet did their work. As she pressed the jewellery to his flesh, they fed him the life force that was draining from him so fast. Olivine watched the human calm down as it dawned on him that she was saving him. His thrashing eased and the kicking of his legs slowed down to just fast enough to keep him from sinking any deeper. The pair watched each other uneasily, one treading water, the other slowly swishing her tail, fingers intertwined in a strangely intimate gesture. Olivine was starkly aware that if she let go, he might panic again. But they couldn't stay like this. She would need to take her hands off the stones to untie him. And when she did, she would begin to drown. If she went to touch them again, would he think she was trying to take them from her? She was far away from any other merfolk, and therefore from any more life stones. Slowly, so slowly, she released her grip from his fingers and signed, I'm sorry. He wouldn't understand, of course. Humans and merfolk hadn't had anything to do with each other for many, many years, so there would inevitably be a language gap. But surely he would recognize a friendly attempt to communicate when he saw one. He looked at her in amazement. And then, to Olivine's own incredulity, he signed, Friend. Olivine's body started to feel uncomfortable all over as she started to crave the life stones. But for a moment, she ignored it. She couldn't ignore this. You speak sign. He smiled and clenched one fist and inclined it. Yes. 